last video we thought about the federal government and its budget. We showed that the government has a substantial deficit. $833 billion is projected as the deficit for 2018. And uh, with deficits accruing year after year, we now have a substantial debt that's over $20 trillion. One thing people have argued is we should just have a balanced budget. Um, this is something that I hear a lot just from just regular Joes on the street. You know, I'll tell them I'm an economist and they'll say things like, well, why doesn't our government just spend the money that it has? You know, why doesn't the government do like people do and avoid debt, try to avoid it? Um, and a lot of times what they suggest is a balanced budget. Balanced budgets occur often at local levels, sometimes at state levels. So why don't we just have a balanced budget at the federal level? Well, let's see what would happen. Key thing to recognize with a balanced budget is its spending must be equal to its revenues. Okay? If these two things aren't equal, then it's not a balanced budget. So let's remember that moving forward. And we're going to use Keynesian economics to consider the validity of this. So let's imagine scenario one is the economy enters a recessionary gap for whatever reason, okay? Let's, let's just allow that to be something that just occurs for whatever reason, and let's imagine what happens to our economy based on a balanced budget. So here's our real GDP. Here's our CPI. Here's our aggregate supply. And here is our aggregate demand. So that's where we are to begin, and suddenly the economy enters a recessionary gap. So aggregate demand decreases to a point where the economy is now producing less than its full potential. Okay? Now I did this on purpose. I showed the decrease here. I wanted to illustrate that decrease um, because that is what's going to cause some problems to occur, okay? So let's think about what happens. When real GDP decreases, what does that mean? What else is going to change? If the real GDP is decreasing, what else is that going to affect? Um, well, if you remember from prior chapters, Real GDP tells us the same thing as income, meaning if I produce something and sell it for $20, I earn $20 in income, and also I produce $20 worth of product. So that's going to create $20 worth of GDP and $20 worth of income. So when I say the real GDP decreases, that's the same thing as saying real incomes decrease. Okay. Think about what that means. If real incomes decrease, how is that going to affect the government? What is the number one source of government revenues? Income taxes. So the result here is that income taxes decrease. Okay, and to be clear, this is not this is not expansionary fiscal policy. Okay, I'm not saying tax rates are decreased. I'm not saying the government goes in and decreases taxes. Rather, there are just fewer people working, so the government's just not getting as much money. Okay? All right? So this is not, a, again, this is not going to speed up the economy because we're not cutting rates. It's just cutting revenues because of the increase in unemployment. Right? If we go from 4.5% unemployment to 7% unemployment, then you just have a lot fewer people working, so tax revenues go down. Well, if revenues decrease and we have a balanced budget, that means government has to spend less. Okay? The government has to spend less because it has less revenues. Remember, we have a balanced budget. So if one changes, the other one's got to change. they got to move in unison. So when revenues decrease, government must decrease its spending as well. And when this occurs, aggregate demand decreases due to contractionary policies. Okay? When tax revenues go down here, that's not a policy. That's just a response to the fact that fewer people are working. 
But this is a policy. This is the government going out there and saying, all right, we got to shut down programs, right? We got to shut down programs. You know, we had this, for example, we have, uh, you know, NASA. We're just going to have to close NASA because revenues are down. When revenues go down and they close NASA, that reduces aggregate demand because those people lose their job too. And as a result, the real GDP decreases. And what you'll see here is this is going to create a cycle, okay? Aggregate demand decreases due to contractionary policies, 83. Real GDP drops as a result, okay? When real GDP drops, real incomes decrease again. Income tax revenues decrease again. The government must further decrease its spending, leading to less disposable income and aggregate demand decreasing again. So this is not a good policy, okay? A balanced budget is going to cause a disaster in this example because anytime the economy shrinks a bit, the government's going to cause the economy to shrink even further, okay? Remember, Keynes recommended counter-cyclical uh, government policies, counter-cyclical fiscal policies, and this is the opposite of this, okay? Counter-cyclical policies would mean when real GDP declines, real, un real incomes decrease, then the government should increase its spending. Here, we're doing the opposite of that. So anytime the economy gets worse, this policy is going to make it get even worse. Okay? I was going to go through a second example showing it moving the other way, but in the effort of time, I'm, I'm not going to cover that for now. Instead, we're going to shift gears a bit. Okay? All right, so we showed our government's in a deficit. Uh, balanced budget's not going to fix it. What are we going to have to do? Well, we're going to have to make some big changes just to, just to conclude this section. We've got to figure out a way to uh, bring in more tax revenue or spend less. As an economist, I, you know, I don't know what we can do. We, we've been really bad at this in the U.S. for a long period of time. Um, what we need is better politicians. I don't know how that's going to happen. Uh, it's a tough thing to actually occur. So what I'm going to talk about now is other problems with um, fiscal policies. So we've talked about uh, the governmental debt, okay, which is one reason why expansionary fiscal policies haven't worked, okay? Expansionary fiscal policies, they've worked in the short run, but they've led us to this debt. And that's not the only problem that we have. Another problem is something called lags. And this is a very general term, okay? This is not like an economic in industry term. Uh, it's just a time lag, okay? This is basically just pointing out that when the economy gets worse, it takes a long time. for expansionary fiscal policies to be implemented and help fix the problem. Okay, and usually what I do in this section is I, I explain all these different lags, but again, I'm trying to make sure we move pretty quickly here because you guys just had an exam, and so I'm cutting out some of the, cutting out some of the fat in this lecture today. Um, so to, just to give you an example, let's say the economy um, shrinks on August 1st, 2018. And let's think about what would occur after this, okay? If the economy shrinks in 2018, August 2018, what would Keynes recommend? He would recommend expansionary fiscal policy. When the economy enters that recessionary gap, the government helps fill the gap by engaging in expansionary fiscal policy. But let's think about in reality what this would look like, okay? And in the book, they discuss these different lags, with the first being a data lag. A 
data lag. Okay, so a data lag um, is basically the fact that when the economy shrinks on August 1st, it takes a long time to know about it. So when the economy shrinks on August 1st, we're not going to know about it for a couple of weeks or a couple of months, right? Meaning, if you right now search the unemployment rate in the United States, you're not going to find what the unemployment rate is today. The newest data you're going to find is probably from a month or two ago. And the data that you're going to get is actually still really just an estimate. It's not real accurate. So the data lag is basically the time it takes for us to even know the economy has entered a recessionary gap. Okay? So what happens is now, after the data lag, it's now December 1st, and now we're sure that the economy did shrink. Well, what are you going to do about it? Okay? You probably don't want to do anything yet. You probably don't want to become really aggressive. You probably want to wait and see if this is a trend. And in fact, the book calls the next lag the wait and see lag. The wait and see lag is just uh, the, the time it takes to realize if this is a trend. All right, so we could also call this the is this a trend lag. Meaning when the economy shrinks, um, that kind of thing happens a lot but most of the time it just immediately rebounds. Um, a classic example of this is a few years ago uh, in the first quarter of, I believe, I think it was 2016, the economy shrunk just because it was really cold. Uh, we had like a lot of snow, a lot of ice, people couldn't go to work, so the economy shrunk, but then it immediately rebounded. We had a really strong following quarter. Um, so if you immediately freak out every time we see the data reveal that there's a recessionary gap, the economy is going to be constantly being fought by the government, and that's not what we want. So the wait and see lag is just to wait and see if this is a problem worth trying to fix. And you probably wait at least another quarter. So maybe by February 1st, 2019, we're now confident that the economy is in a recession, okay, or at least a recessionary gap. So to reiterate, August 1st, 2018, the economy shrinks. We don't know about it until December 1st. Then we wait to see if it's a trend. We wait a couple more months, and now it's February 1st. We still haven't done anything about it. So now we decide we want to do something about it. We want to fight this. So the federal government decides we're going to take action, and we're going to do some expansionary fiscal policy. The next lag is the legislative lag. And this is just the time it takes for the governmental policies to actually be put into law. This is the time it takes for the government to argue about things, right? When the government wants to pass a law, it can't just do it overnight. It often takes a few months or several months, and sometimes it doesn't get passed at all. Um, it's hard for politicians to agree on matters. So, for example, if this is something that's done with the Senate, you know, you've got Republican senators and Democratic senators. Um, they're going to butt heads, and it's going to be hard for them to, to, to choose a law and agree to a law that satisfies parties well enough that they'll vote for it. So the legislative lag might take six months. So now it's August 1st, 2019. Um, by the way, after the Great Recession, it took about six months to get our laws passed then, too, to create the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. Um, so you can see the problem. The economy shrunk on, on August 2018. It's a year later, and we still have just now passed a law. Well, after you pass a law, that still is not going to immediately cause the economy to start to rebound because the laws are going to be expansionary fiscal policy based. So, for example, let's say the government is going to fix this by uh, repairing bridges. This is something that people talk about a lot. Maybe the government should just go in and start repairing bridges. Our infrastructure is kind of crumbling in the U.S., so this is something we could do. If the government wants to repair bridges, it can't just hire somebody and say, go out there and fix them. It's going to create contracts, create proposals, and wait for engineering firms and construction firms to go out and view the proposal, go to the site, uh, look at the site, see if it's feasible that they can do the job, create some sort of bid, right? write up a contract of what they would be wanting to do, and then give it to the government. Then the government chooses which of the people who have suggested they would work on the bridge is actually going to be the one to do it. What typically happens is you have four or five firms saying, I would like to rebuild this bridge. The government looks at all of these proposals and it chooses the lowest bidder, okay? The one that says they can do it for the cheapest. This all takes a tremendous amount of time. So this next lag, as the book puts it, is the transmission lag. 
This is the lag between when government policies have been made and actually something happens. So the time between when the government says, okay, we're going to build the bridges to when the bridges, the bridges actually start being built. Okay. And this can take a really long time. There are still policies or projects from the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009 that haven't started yet. So it can take a really long time. Um, and maybe another six months is, is a good estimate. So that takes us up to, to what? February 1st, 2020 now? And there's one more lag that we need to deal with. The book calls the effectiveness lag. So they start building the bridges, okay? But the people that are working, that, remember the whole goal of this is to boost disposable income, okay? So think about it. When they start building the bridges, people don't get paychecks the first day. It takes a couple of weeks to get paychecks, okay? They're probably moving from other parts of the country to come there, so it takes them a while to even get there and start working. It takes them a couple of weeks to get the paychecks, and even after they get the paychecks, you know, they may not spend it for a while, so the effectiveness lag is just the time it takes for people to actually start spending the money that they're, they're newly earning. And this is a, a quicker lag. Maybe it takes a, you know, a month or two. So maybe, maybe two months. The whole point here is to recognize that when the economy shrinks, it takes a tremendous amount of time for the government to actually do anything about it. Okay? So when we've talked about Keynes, you know, we, we've drawn this graph, right? And we've said, you know, here's aggregate supply and here's aggregate demand. If it's like this, the government just does expansionary fiscal policy, bada bing, bada boom, we fix the recession. We fix this recessionary gap. But in reality, it's a lot more challenging than, than that. And in this case here, this took uh, nearly two years to go from when the economy first had its downturn to the fiscal policy actually doing anything. And by this point, maybe the economy is starting to fix itself anyway. So... There are problems with classical economics. Classical economics has assumptions that aren't true, right? We know interest rates aren't always flexible and wages aren't always flexible. But Keynesian policies also aren't necessarily going to work. Even though they theoretically make sense, they take too long to actually be justifiable. And furthermore, when our government engages in these, it tends to make bad decisions and engage in expansionary fiscal policy all the time, causing debt. So the bottom line is there's no simple policy that seems to work best. We've got to pick and choose, sometimes do classical economics, meaning don't do any expansionary fiscal policy, and sometimes do Keynesian policies when you think the recession is going to be very long. When you think the economy is going to be bad for a really long time, that's when you want to do something like this, because when the policies actually start to become effective, you want it to be fighting something. So when we engaged in the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, it had a similar uh, gap between when the economy began to shrink and when actually our uh, laws made a difference. But it was a good thing we did it because the economy still hadn't rebounded at this point in time. So fiscal policies can only work when the economy is really bad and it's really not fixing itself. All right, so that's problems with fiscal policy. We've got debt, we've got lags, one more. One more is called crowding out. Crowding out is when expansionary fiscal policies harm the private sector. Okay, expansionary fiscal policies, that's government spending and cutting taxes. We're focusing largely on government spending. So this is when government spending hurts the private sector. So for example, this is when the government spending, I, let's say I run a little ice cream shop downtown. Government spending could hurt my little ice cream shop. We're going to show why. Okay. There's two forms of crowding out that we're going to talk about today. There's direct and there's indirect. And there's also two extents of crowding out. There's complete and incomplete. And so we need to talk about all of these right now. Okay. So let's start with direct. Direct is really the easiest one. It's 
hard to define, direct crowding out. Um, but it's an easy concept, and I think once you see a couple of examples, you'll understand what direct crowding out is. It's hard, it is hard to define, though. Um, this is when government spending directly, all right, that's why I don't like this definition, is because I'm using the word direct in the definition. Um, but this is when government spending directly hurts private businesses. And this is a real problem. We know this is a real problem, and we don't have a real good solution of how to avoid this problem. Um, let me give you a couple of examples. So for example, let's say the government builds a public university in Macon. Okay? Are there any private businesses that are going to be uh, hurt by this? Well, let, let's put it this way. Let's say that I'm thinking about going to college and I want to go to college in Macon for whatever reason um, and I'm planning on going to Mercer. Well, maybe after this, this uh, public college is built, I don't go to Mercer anymore and I instead go to this public college. What's happening is the public college is crowding out Mercer, which is a private college. Okay, so the public spending made by the government hurts the private sector in this case, Mercer University. Certainly Georgia College does this, right? Georgia College hurts Mercer's business. Mercer is gonna make lower profits, they're gonna have a harder time being successful because of universities like Georgia College. So public spending is hurting private sector businesses. Uh, let me give you another example. say the, pub, the um, government builds a public zoo in Atlanta. Uh, by the way, federal government does own a zoo. If you go to Washington, D.C., you can go to the, the zoo they have there, and it's free, and it's, it's a great zoo. But there are going to be businesses that are harmed by this, okay? For example, let's say I'm thinking I'm going to take my kid to go do something. I have a kid. She loves going to zoos. She also loves going to Chuck E. Cheese. So I'm going to choose between the two. And I decide, you know what? Rather than going to Chuck E. Cheese, I'm going to go to the zoo. Well, in this case, the zoo is actually hurting the private business. It's hurting Chuck E. Cheese. All right? This is direct crowding out because there are direct businesses that are being adversely affected by the public businesses. Let me give you just one more example just to drive this point home. Let's say the government builds a library. Stick with Atlanta again. Okay, government builds a, a, a nice new library in Atlanta. People are going to enjoy it. Doesn't mean the library is not worth it, but there are negative consequences. Okay, so for example, if I own a private bookstore, if people go to the library instead of coming to my bookstore, my sales go down, my revenues go down, and maybe I close my business down as a result. Okay, again, that doesn't mean the library is not a good thing, it just means that there may be adverse consequences. The point to be made here is when the government spends money, the whole goal is to give people more disposable income. But if there's direct crowding out, that might have not the desired effect. The goal of expansionary fiscal policy is to increase disposable income. YD. But crowding out could eliminate the benefits. Right? If they build the library, that will help spur economic growth because it's going to, you know, create some jobs. But if I close down my bookstore because I can't be successful anymore, maybe we're not really getting any benefit out of this at all. All right, so that's the problem with crowding out. That's direct crowding out. Let's now talk about indirect crowding out. The first thing to recognize is where does the government get the money that it spends? Okay, the government gets the money that it spends from two sources, from taxes and from government spending. 
Now, if it's engaging in expansionary fiscal policy, that means it's spending borrowed money, all right? Think about that. If the economy is, is, is in a really bad place, if it's in a recessionary gap, and the government wants to engage in expansionary fiscal policy, it's not going to raise taxes to spend because that's not expansionary fiscal policy, right? If I'm taking money from people via taxes and spending it, that's not expansionary fiscal policy because I'm lowering their disposable income when I get their taxes. So instead, what the government does is when it engages in expansionary fiscal policy, it doesn't raise taxes, it spends more most of the time. Okay, so the other style of crowding out we have to worry about is indirect crowding out. And this one's a little easier to define. So when the government engages in expansionary fiscal policies, it does so by borrowing. And it actually doesn't matter if we're talking about an increase in government spending or cut in taxes. Okay? So think about it. Uh, and, and don't worry about writing this down if you're taking notes. But let's say the government right now is spending $3 trillion and uh, government revenues are also $3 trillion. What could they do in terms of expansionary fiscal policy here? They have two options. One thing they could do is cut or raise spending to maybe four trillion. Well, now they've got a one trillion dollar gap here that they're going to have to borrow for. Okay. The other possibility, expansionary fiscal policy, can always be done in two ways. One is to spend more. The other thing is to cut taxes. So if they cut taxes, maybe they only bring in two trillion dollars in revenues. This still leaves the government with having to borrow money. So the question is, when the government borrows money, what happens? Okay, and we know there's some problems here. Indirect crowding out is addressing these problems. When the government spends money to engage in expansionary policies, it does so by borrowing. This leads to less private borrowing, which can slow economic growth. Basically what's happening here is when the government wants to borrow money and it calls up, you know, for example, banks and says, you know, I want to try to issue more government bonds so that we can borrow money, the money is, is gone. No one can borrow it. As a result, interest rates go up. And if I'm thinking about, you know, building a new house, I might go to the bank and they may say, well, we don't have any money for you. Or they may charge me such a high interest rate that I'm not interested. So the bottom line is private borrowing decreases as a result. So let me just give you one quick example here. This is hard to give examples because um, it's not really specific, all right? It's just very general. So for example, I'm thinking of starting a new business. And to start a new business, that almost always means that I'm gonna have to do some borrowing. Anytime a business is started, uh, I say anytime, virtually anytime a business is started, it's done so by borrowing. Um, for example, if, if, if I wanted to start a brewery in Milledgeville, you know, I'm probably going to have to have a few million dollars just to start the business. I don't have a few million dollars, so I'm going to have to find some investors, right? That might mean going to the bank. That might mean going to my friends. But the bottom line is I'm going to have to borrow money, okay? So I go to my friends and I borrow $100,000 from each to help fund my business. If instead the government has been borrowing a lot of money, and I go to my friends and say, can I borrow 100 grand? They may answer with, well, I loaned the money to the government. The government was offering really nice interest rates, so my money's there. Now I don't get to start my brewery because I can't borrow the money. Okay? So if I'm thinking, raise, think of, thinking of raising funds to start a new business, um, but now I can't due to extensive governmental borrowing. This is indirect crowding out, okay? And the thing to recognize here is that expansionary policies will almost always create both 
direct and indirect crowding out. So for example, if the government borrows money to build new libraries, the direct crowding out happens to bookstores. When the libraries are built, that hurts bookstores. The indirect crowding out comes from the government having to borrow to fund those bookstores. When they borrow money, private sector can't borrow that money anymore. It's gone. It's being used. Okay? So this is a major criticism of expansionary fiscal policies that Keynes largely ignored. So we've got governmental debt. We know that the government does a poor job of handling fiscal policies. It tends to do too much expansionary policy creating debt. We've got those time lags, which is just pointing out that when the government wants to do expansionary fiscal policy, it takes a really long time to actually do that. And then thirdly, we've got crowding out, which is basically pointing out when the government does policies, there are people that are adversely affected. Okay, So these suddenly make Keynesian policies seem not so great. One last note here, I'm not going to go over it. These are very easy concepts, complete and incomplete crowding out. Um, I want you to read those in your book or find it online. I'm not going to worry about teaching it today because it's very easy, but you will be quizzed on it. Okay, that's the end of the second video for chapter 11.